Welcome to another episode of the E&E Show, where we talk about equipping and enabling believers worldwide to reach unbelievers and make disciples. I'm Bucky Elliott, the media director here at International Commission. And today we have a guest who knows a lot about this topic, and that is Pastor Johnny Hunt. You probably know his name. He is a Christ follower, a husband, a dad to two daughters. He's got several grandkids. He's the former senior pastor of FBC Woodstock in Georgia the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and now Pastor Johnny is serving as the senior vice president of evangelism and pastoral leadership at the North American Mission Board. Welcome, Johnny. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Bucky. It's a joy to be with you. Absolutely. Um, will you tell us a little bit about your role at the North American Mission Board? All right. First of all, it's been a real um, prayer of mine and that the last chapter of my life be used a little different than pastoring, believe it or not. So after 43 years pastoring, 33 years at Woodstock, uh, came on here, as you mentioned, uh, Senior VP of Evangelism and Pastoral Leadership. So I've continued my Timothy Barnabas training pastors and wives in instruction and encouragement, moving into our 27th year, beginning in January. And I've always had, by the grace of God, a culture of evangelism, evangelistic churches, in the four that I served over the 43 years, Woodstock being certainly the most notable, a church that, and to God be the glory, but we averaged 500 baptisms a year for our entire tenure there. And so we kept it out in front of people. And I look forward to talking about what it takes to create a culture of evangelism. And now to have the opportunity, not just to speak into one church and its influence and the other platforms God's given me, but now to be in a place where we can really attempt to inspire, encourage, and equip an entire denomination, the largest evangelical denomination to ever exist on the North American continent. But that won't continue to be true if we don't turn this ship around. And that's our hopes here at North American Mission Board. That's really exciting uh, because at International Commission, that's what we're all about, sharing the gospel, partnering with churches, equipping and enabling uh, pastors and and their congregations to share the gospel. Uh, and so, of course, that takes resourcing, training, tools. Will you tell us a little bit about some of the tools uh, that you use at North American Mission Board to equip pastors to lead their churches in sharing Jesus? Yeah. It seems like what has been the number one tool has been three circles. And so any pastor can go to whosyourone.com or they can go, and this is a great website to know, is to go to namb.net slash evangelism. And that's where we're putting most of our resources because on Who's Your One, we want to keep it a little more pure, but we've got that. And then James Merritt uh, really honored us by doing his uh, witnessing ministry called Best Question. I mean, yeah, Best Question. Uh, something like that. <laughs> and uh, But so we've got that. And these, by the way, Bucky, are absolute free for the churches, for the pastors. Uh, call us, go online, order it. We post pay it, send it to your home. If somebody wanted to say, I'd like to have, say about a three week training with our people. We've got one entitled Live This. Now, there's so many great programs out there uh, we've staged a lot of them for other ministries. Uh, every member a witness would just be an ongoing witnessing program that we've seen to be very effective in local churches. Uh, so we're constantly adding some. Uh, we've added uh, prayer ministry support that they can download that's there. And it's free. If you go a lot further with it, it may be the ministry we recommend has some type fee. But... Um, Gosh, I mean, if resources can turn the convention around or our nation around, uh, we've got it covered. But there's a missing ingredient. That is the person who trains needs to have a passion and a brokenness for the lostness of their friends and family and work associates and neighbors. Amen. And then it doesn't even matter if they've got the right resources. They are going to share. And we'll talk about how to make a difference in someone else's life. That's so great, Pastor Johnny. Thanks for saying that and saying it that way. Uh, I think something that uh, that uh, James Merritt says is 
I don't know if it's original to him. That's that's where I've heard it. The best evangelism tool is the one that you'll actually use. Right, exactly. Because if you don't have the passion to to do that, you don't have a burden for uh, souls who need to know Jesus. Either you don't have the motivation, or you might not have the right motivation, or or idea, or goal in mind when you're sharing the gospel. Because we need to have a love for people that comes from the Lord and spills out, and we got to be sharing the gospel with people because we love them, right? Yep. Psalms 126, 5. Most people probably know it, but they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Uh, when there's more weepers of, of tears, there's going to be more winners of souls. And it's God's got to break hearts. So we got a lot of people that are training and they've got a lot of head knowledge as to what they should do, but it's never really captured their heart. And when that happens, then the additional training just becomes a way of being more effective and even more aggressive maybe in your evangelism. But uh, nothing will ever trump a brokenness and a passion for people that you believe are perishing and already stand condemned. Amen. So the, the big question on a lot of pastors' mind, I think, then is, is what's the key to fostering a, a culture of evangelism in their churches? How, how do we inject this passion into our people? I've met with evangelism professors at our seminaries, our colleges. We've talked to our state directors of evangelism and leading pastors in America. And I'd be one of the first to say a hearty amen in what I've tried to model. And that is there will be no evangelistic culture unless the pastor nurtures that before his people. And the question's often, um, how do you do that? And I think you do it by modeling it. Uh, you can you can exhort, but there must be emulation. Um, they must not just hear of your passionate desire for them to be a witness. They must see you model that yourself. And I, I always like to just go back to the simple, monkey see, monkey do. Uh, I go into Woodstock in 34 years ago and basically a small well, 180 people in attendance. And really I began to model. I can still remember the first guy I led to Christ. His name was Ron Payne. He's still at Woodstock, but he was a neighbor. My wife and I were renting a house in the neighborhood, <clears throat> got to know our neighbors, went over and shared the gospel with Ron and Ginger. And this, a couple of weeks into our ministry, I was able to stand down front and say, hey, meet Ron and Ginger. They're coming this morning for baptism. Jan and I went into their home got acquainted with them, built a relationship, and then one day just shared the simple gospel. And then people begin to say, man, I'd like to go with you sometime. I'd like to hear. And back in those days, it was continuing witness training. So we begin to train our people later in faith, and four spiritual laws, and uh, you know, the colored beads on the bracelet. Again, it doesn't matter which one. And James Marriage, by the way, is best news, not best question. I had it wrong. But anyway, so we begin to do that. Then even my last day at Woodstock, after 33 years, and as my last sermon there, I baptized, um, really, it doesn't have to be this way, but a, a famous lady and her son, the husband got right with the Lord and I led the wife and the son to the Lord. So my last day there, I still had the opportunity to model personal evangelism. So I was still doing when I left, what I was doing when I started. And, and that's a great statement uh, of challenge. Sometimes people started out right, but there've been so many distractions, God help us, that we, we're really no longer doing what we started doing. And we need to, there was a song by For Him years ago. It was, over, it was over 30 years old, but it was entitled, Get Back to the Basics. We've got to get back to the basics. And I think that's what a book like Simple Church is all about. <clears throat> you, you've got so much clutter and you're doing a lot of good things, but you're not doing the main thing. Southern Baptist used to say, we've got to keep the main thing, the main thing. So I would constantly be preaching and I'd say something like this, man, I was on a plane the other day and I was really wanting to study, but the guy beside me, as a parent, he wanted to talk. And then I began, came sensitive, turned this conversation into a gospel conversation. And I would tell how I put my notes up and engaged a man and, and found a way to say, you know, where do you live? Hey, do you go to church anywhere there? I know that city, you got some friends there. Uh, yeah, I go here and I think, well, 
Hey, can I ask you a question? Since you've been attending there, have you ever turned from your sins and put your faith in Christ? And I, I asked them that as easy as I would say, hey, how about the Braves? I mean, I want to know that was not a scary transition. <clears throat> and then we get into the gospel and I tell them, since I've got a deep voice and I'm on the plane, no longer my witness and one person who got me a little Sunday school Everybody class. Everybody listen to you. Yeah, about three or four uh, chairs in, in each direction, uh, seats are listening. But I would tell those stories. And then before too long, somebody would say, man, you really challenged me. And today I was flying to Seattle and I engaged a guy with the gospel. And then they begin to, to emulate what I'd emulated before them. So, but I need to stand in the pool periodically with someone that I've had the opportunity to share the gospel with and baptize them. I needed to model it. And, uh, and then I, I, I can still remember a lady named Cindy saying, this is unbelievable. I never witnessed to my mom and dad, never thought about it. And then she started crying. I know I cared where they'd spend eternity, but I'd not, not made it a personal possession of mine. But after hearing you talk about leading your mom and witnessing to your dad, boy, I went and shared the gospel and both my parents are on the way to heaven. So, and then you know what you do, get the video crowd, get that story. That's right. And so before you introduce Matthew 9, 36, you say, I want you to watch this story or in the middle of it, use video or have them to get up and give their testimony. Uh, we let them baptize their friends. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we really did create a culture where it was unusual. Hardly ever in 33 years was there a Sunday that somebody was not baptized in Praise one of our services. Praise God. Uh, it would be like, oh my God, today, we're not baptizing today? Are you kidding me? You know, so. Sounds a lot like Acts. The, the yeah, exactly. Day, you know, God was adding to their number daily. Continually and, adding to their numbers daily, yeah. Yeah, awesome. they had, they had. I don't know what kind of heart carpet they argued about there, but it was wet most of the time. <laughs> it was wet, that's they're, right. They're dunking people. They, they never could de de really discern what color it was to argue. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to argue about out, it. It's really always wet. <laughs> That's great. That is great. <laughs> so seeing seeing it modeled is really powerful, and uh, I, I believe that in that 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 telling the stories of leading people to Christ in, in just ordinary everyday interactions like that, it helps it helps other believers realize that it's not that difficult. It's not that complicated. It might be hard and scary to, to, to get into doing and to start doing, but hearing those stories about how people have come to Christ with a simple presentation of the gospel and a simple presentation can really encourage others to see themselves in that and to see, to start to recognize opportunities that they have. Is that right? Yeah. You know, Bucky, we, we try to say this, um, give the gospel and then, um, uh, cover up behind that with your own story, come up behind it with your own story. But the gospel is the power of God on salvation. So, and, and I gotta be honest, I think to start with, and it was okay, it was all I knew, I would give my story and then kind of come back a little bit with the gospel. But what we try to say is let the gospel be the core and the center and then tell our story. So either way, <clears throat> you wanna get it in there, but here's a great statement that God's put in my heart in recent days. First Thessalonians 1.5, the gospel does not travel alone. It says, I did not come to you in word only, but in power and the Holy Spirit. The gospel always travels with the power of God and the Spirit of God. So what a person will realize is they're fearful, and that's okay, it's just that the fear should not paralyze us, maybe make us more dependent. So, and I want people to know that, I, I mean, I get a little, Fearful too that, oh my God, I'm going to see Jack tonight. And he's he's one rough dude. I mean, God, please go before me. And you get in there and you're a little hesitant and you begin to share the gospel. And as you're sharing, you look over and Jack's fighting back tears. And you realize it's not your conversation, but now you know that the gospel is not traveling along. You begin to see the power of God and the spirit of God. And when that begins to happen, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Now that person becomes somewhat of a bold individual that says to their friends, oh, you just don't know. That's well, right. You can be a little afraid to start with, but you've got to see that. I mean, see the, I, I can think as a pastor, I have really good eye contact when I preach. Some preachers look at the back wall. Uh, 
I look. Now the bad thing is I see the people I put to sleep and uh, <laughs> other watching their phones, but I many times have watched and thought, gosh, I got to look in the other direction. That guy is hard. He is not interested. He don't even want to be here. He just became, came because it's Mother's Day and promised his wife he would do anything. And she invited him to church. But I've watched the gospel uh, soften, harden people. You know, the Bible says that thy word is a hammer, a hammer. So breaking a hard heart is a fire. It's melting them. And I've watched it melt them. And one of my favorite stories is a friend named Rocky that responded to the invitation and I always posed the question. I looked at him and I said, sir, why are you coming? And here was his answer. You never forget this and you can't make it up. He said, sir, I don't know because I, I don't like you and I don't like this church. <laughs> but what it happened, he said, but while you were speaking this morning, something happened in my heart. And what it was again, the spirit of God and the word of God. Right. The church of God used to sing an old song. While they were preaching, somebody touched me. Mm -hmm. must have been the hand of the Lord. And so I really believe, uh, I, teach, I was mentoring a young preacher yesterday and and, and he said, Are, do you still get butterflies? I said, yeah, they their wings seem to be smaller than they were oh, that's when I first point. started. And I said, but yes, I still get them. And I said, but Adrian Rogers taught me, Johnny, when you're preparing to preach, little prayer, little power, more prayer, more power, much prayer, much power. And I can't get away from that to think, you know, uh, my sermon's ready for Sunday, but am I ready? Am I ready? So now Sunday mornings is not about making sure I've got it just right. I mean, I, I don't, I hardly even read through the sermon again. I feel like I've got that and it's got me. Now I pray, oh God. And I pray for salvations. I was with Robbie Gallaty two weeks ago and he said, Pastor Johnny, pray for salvations. He said, since COVID, and we open back up. Every Sunday, the number has been eight people have gotten saved. I thought, good night, I hope I don't mess it up. So I asked Robbie, I said, Robbie, and then I wrote my prayer partners. I said, would you join me in praying that God would save 10 today? And I mean, and so I, that week I began to pray, God really in Jesus name, save 10 people. I mean, you know, if it saves a hundred, that's great. Mm -hmm. And so Robbie texts me after the service of Pastor Johnny, 11 received Christ this morning. Amen. And I just thought, I mean, we, we ask, we pray, and we say we believe prayer matters, but yeah, we're gonna, gonna pray for, for God to come through. But uh, preachers see that as they preach and people are changed. Uh, one fellow said to me one time, they said, man, how many were saved Sunday? I said, it was, it was a big day, it was like 27. He said, man, what did you preach? And this'll do you good. Play that sermon, it sounds just like the rest of them. Oh, it was yeah. not your sermon, it was the Spirit of God it was the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so when we realize that, you know, God does honor his word, but it's not like, you know, if you start thinking you've got a particular message that gets them down the aisle, that almost hinges on the the verge of manipulation yeah. to think I can manipulate the sermon. No, I am dependent on God. I have a guy in Kenya that he he'll he receives my sermons every week. And then he'll he'll ride through the bush on a motorbike going to villages to preach. He's a really intelligent guy named Moses. And he'll text me sometime and say, Pastor Johnny, I just left a, vi a village and 61 people were saved. And I'll text him back and say, Moses, you need to come to my church and preach it. I preached it last <laughs> week. Nobody was saved. <laughs> so it, it's, it's God. And, I mean, God definitely gets the glory. Uh, Absolutely. Hey, you know, there's there's another, I'm reminded of another uh, evangelist from South Carolina. Some people know his name, uh, Billy Graham. Oh, yeah. Ring a bell. And uh, when he was asked what what the, his keys to success were, he would say, there's three keys to success, prayer, prayer, and prayer. That is true. You know, we, we've seen the, the grand results of the, of the campaigns that, that he ran and other guys like uh, Luis Palau. And really the core of all that was prayer. They were praying, they got the churches in the city engaged in praying. And, and the faith was in God to move, not in the, the preacher to, to, to speak well, even though they did, even though God gifts, gifts people in that way. It's, it's the faith in God and that he's gonna move and he's gonna do what he desires to do. He's just, he's just left the task, he's just left the task to us 
to go and tell. Yeah. Henry Blackman Baker only said, uh, Pastor Johnny, Jesus decided he was going to do something significant at Woodstock. Thank him every day that he just decided to let you come along and join him. And that's really it. God, I mean, when you, you can talk about what happened to see all the growth. But in the end of the day, uh, if we fail to give glory to his name, he will curse our blessing. Malachi 2.2. 2. So that's a powerful word. God did it. He I'm glad he let us, you know, be on the sidelines. As Toby Mack was saying, uh, come on, Jesus, steal my show. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it is his, you know. That's it is. right. That's right. Glory to, to God and and all of the all the pressures on him, too. Uh, I think exactly. I think when we think about that and, and what you've said, really, it's encouraging to not just pastors, missionaries, evangelists, but to to any ordinary believer. I really don't think there is an ordinary believer, but you know what I mean? Uh, lay, lay persons who want to share the gospel with people but just don't know what to say, where to start. Man, be encouraged that when when the pressure's on God to save souls, it's off of you. Yeah, exactly. A successful no evangelism isn't measured in how many people that you uh, can lead in a prayer of salvation, how many people you can get to come down the aisle. It's whether or not you faithfully, clearly preach the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, that's the success in preaching the gospel as you were faithful to give his message and leave the results to God. Absolutely. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, what, what are some ways though, then for, for individuals who, who want to evangelize, share their yeah. faith, how, how can they turn those everyday conversations to a gospel conversation? What, what's some advice, what's your best advice for people who want to share Christ, but just don't know where to start? Yeah. Uh, they need to have a lot of grace toward themselves, you know, because they're probably going to think, oh, God, I hear him all the time. I was going to witness this man. I got all confused and he asked me a question. I was tangled up. Well, the enemy would like to stop you right there because uh, he's fearful of the power of the gospel. So I, I would I would start today. I would learn and memorize thy word have I hid in my heart, treasure my heart, that I may not sin against God. So I want to treasure. So I would start with something like the Roman road. I mean, Romans 3.23, Romans 3.10, Romans 6.23, and then Romans 5.8. I mean, I just memorize it so easy. And then I can just say, uh, you know, uh, here's the truth about how you can experience the same life change I have. And all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. I mean, you have to, the Bible says that it's the really the gospel that gives us the knowledge of our own, our sin, the truth of God's word. And then that there's none good, and, but yet God demonstrated his love. And not when we decided to change, but even while we were yet sinners. And, and I love to be able to tell someone because Bill Bright used to always say in the four spiritual laws, and I love those. Somebody says, well, it doesn't have enough repentance. Well, add it in there, you know, <laughs> you, you get your satisfaction. But don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what I loved about the fourth law was you must individually receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, so now it's come down to an individual. So I share that a lot. And then I just ask someone like, um, and I've got videos of some of my friends I led to Christ sharing this. Then number one, I didn't give up on them, and that's a miracle of God, because <clears throat> you've shared with him so many times. But when my, one of my friends said he knew that if he had lunch with me, that it was just a matter of time, I was going to share the gospel. He, I think he would have left saying, his wife would have probably said, well, Pastor Johnny, pressure today. You know, he never even brought it up, but he would say, uh, uh, yep, I knew it was coming. Sometimes he starts with it, sometimes he ends with it, sometimes while we're eating. But uh, it was one of my best friends, 28 years and nine months. And he gave his life Christ. Now he teaches Sunday school, sings in the choir. So you tell those stories and to inspire, you inspire people, but then you equip people. So I learned the Roman road. And so what I do is take the gospel and then wrap my story around it. Take right. the gospel, my story around it. And so constantly, whether I'm on a plane, uh, if, sometimes you're at a restaurant and a lady you know, she was waiting on a very large group. And I was at the end of the table because I didn't want to ask the questions where it would kind of embarrass her. Or, and I didn't want the guys to think I'm trying to put on a show of how to witness. But I mean, I just said to the lady, boy, you took great care of us. I bet you have children at home. 
said, yeah, I'm a single mom. Then I thought, gosh, you know, I was raised by a single mom. And guess what? My mom was a waitress. And it just drew her in. It was like she became relaxed. And how old are your children? Yeah. Hey, so you live right here in uh, Longview, do you? Yeah. Hey, can I ask you a question? Are you a, are you attending church anywhere? So, oh, my God. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, maybe it'll help me. I, I, I was raised in church, but uh, I haven't been. Hey, where, where did you go? And she mentioned the church, and I said, when you were attending there, did you ever turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus? I mean, and it, it never broke any stride with the, the flow of our conversation any more than I said, hey, when you go to the kitchen, can you bring me another Diet Coke? I mean, it was just that simple. And then, I mean, and then we, I mean, I, she liked to drown me with beverage then, you know, just <laughs> kept coming back, coming back, coming back. I have excuses to talk to you. I mean, she really let it be known that she was deeply appreciative that I, that I asked. And, and I'm just, I mean, I like fresh stories. This was just two weeks ago. But uh, two athletes, it was in a large room where I spoke. Two athletes, young young African-American men, walked across the room. One's name's Jordan, one's name's Greg. I, I just remember from talking to them, and they, one standing on my right, one to the left, and they said, uh, Mr. Hunt, we've never heard you. I was there as guest preacher. They said, you really touched us today, you really touched. And I looked down and they said, yes, sir, me too. And so I said, now you guys play on a basketball team, yeah. Well, let, let me ask you, you, so you're not from here, are you? No, I'm in a little place in Louisiana. No, I'm, I'm from um, a, a place outside of um, Austin, Texas. And so we were gonna talk and I said, gosh, I was just in Austin. I, I spoke at Hyde Park, sir, I know where that is. And then I, that night I was with my friend Danny Porsche over at Great, I know where Great Hills is too. And I said, do you go to either one of them? Mr. Hunt, I hardly ever go, but, um, you know, when I do go, I go to this hill country or something. And I said, hey, when you were attending there, did you ever turn from your sins, put your faith in Jesus? He said, no, sir, it's really why I come over to talk to you. I am really getting close. I looked at his friend, he said, me too. So I, I really pressed in with the gospel. And this is after church. I mean, they're there, don't let them leave. And a lot of times people have been touched in a service. So they come to speak to you afterwards. And, and I, only God knows how many I've led to Christ after the church service. And, and so I just uh, moved into gospel. Both of them kind of dug their heels in, very kind, but just said, boy, I'm, I'm just not ready right now. I'm not ready right now. Well, word got to their coach that brought, brought them that morning with about 10 others. And so he followed up and said, tell me about your conversation with Johnny Hunt. Man, we told him we were close. And he followed through, and I even shared 2 Corinthians 6, 2, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you heard, heard his voice, and that weren't me that touched you, it was him, harden not your heart. Both of them gave their life to Christ later in the afternoon. So I watered, he planted, That's right. God gave the increase, you know? But I mean, but I tell those stories all the time, but I want them to be fresh. I don't want to like, you know, 11 years ago, man, I was witness to my cousin. <laughs> yeah, those are great stories too. But I want to keep a fresh testimony of, of being a witness for Christ. And it inspires others in, uh, to see them come to Christ. And then to remind them, too, that um, here's what got me to witness to my dad. I heard somebody explain John 3, 17. He that believeth not is condemned already. And I always thought, you know, if daddy don't get converted soon, one day daddy will die and he'll be condemned. No, 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 no. You're in a state of condemnation now which the word means to be cut loose. It means daddy was already cut loose from any relationship with God in one breath, one heartbeat from being cut loose forever. So I needed to get to daddy because daddy's not going to be condemned. Daddy is condemned. And so I shared with him and then others shared with him. And he started going to a church there in uh, uh, Jenkins, Kentucky and came to faith in Christ. So. But anyway, so, but we tell those stories and I said, man, and, and here's one of the things we have to deal with. And I deal with this in my Who's Your One conference. People say, you know, family's the hardest people to witness to. Well, I want to counteract that because Please do. it can yeah. become, yeah, it can become self-fulfilled prophecy, Bucky. You can begin to believe that so deeply that you think you have an excuse. So then I need to ask this question. Who could possibly love your family and want to see them say more than you. Wow. So you gotta, you're going to have to pull the Noah card here. Uh -huh. Noah didn't witness to his three daughters and three son-in-laws. 
nobody else was because he was the only preacher of righteousness. That's right. And sometimes we're the only one. And we have the relational currency that's needed, that's given us to really the right to speak into their life. And, and, and we can do it tenderly, graciously, burdenly. And my brother gives the story. My brother, I led to Christ about four years after I was a Christian. Now he's pastored the church 31 years, 10 miles north of me. I led my brother Norman to Christ. I baptized him. I licensed him. I ordained him. And so it, it's really, really something. But um, Norman said the first night that he remembered me coming to share the gospel, that when I started telling him what Christ did, he said, I couldn't understand what he was saying. He cried the whole time. And then the song, Tears are a Language God Understands, they're also a language that speaks to lost people. So I wept all the way through it, and yet God used it. And it was still a year after that night before he came to Christ. But, uh, but you know, but I shared it. It was worth that one. Absolutely. It was yeah. worth facing the, the, the fear and the awkwardness to do that. And because the... Look at the look at the benefit that you got. Look at the the harvest that you got to reap to 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 help uh, set him up to then train and teach others to do the same thing. Man, that's that's multiplication right there in your family. Yep, it re really is. In uh, in John's gospel, we have a record in chapter one of five people being saved. And see if I can call them off my head. John the apostle is saved in John one. Jesus leads him to Christ. Andrew is saved. Andrew goes for his brother, Peter. Then Jesus leads Philip to the Lord, and Philip goes for Nathaniel. And here's what God showed me. It's the two areas we're missing it in. Brother tells brother, family goes after family. Uh, Andrew is mentioned three times in the New Testament, all three times bringing somebody to Christ. But he's only mentioned three times in the entire Bible. And yet uh, he touched one, but the one he touched touched thousands. So you mentioned Billy Graham a moment ago. I would have liked to have been the one who invited him as a 15 year old boy. Uh, and he was born in 1918. I know a lot about Dr. Graham, but at, Dr. Graham at the age of 15 came out of the choir loft. And the only reason he was in the choir loft, he felt that Mordecai Ham was picking on him. He felt every night out in front of him, he was pointing at him. So he joined the choir. Hearing and, the story, God, yeah. and God saved him out of the choir. But just think he's preached to more people than anyone thus far that's ever lived eyeball to eyeball in press in their presence. And yet one touched him. And we don't I don't know who I don't know who invited him. You know, I don't even know who invited him. So but Andrew invited Peter and Peter preaches on one day and three thousand was converted. And if I was if I was Andrew, I'd probably say I, I brought him to Jesus. <laughs> and it says that in John 141 says, and he brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. And we do it. And, and that, and then Philip went after Nathaniel, which was his friend. Friends bring friends. If we could get family bringing family and friends being friends, we could turn this nation around. Absolutely. And the whole world. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we've unfortunately got to wrap up, but I want to talk about resources again uh, real quick because this is a real great segue from what you said. Um, we use a model on our international projects, our national to national evangelism project called Operation Andrew, which was developed by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Wow. And that's the idea. You pray for your friends and family who are lost. You tell them you're praying for them. You invest in that relationship. You share the gospel with them. Uh, Andrew brought Peter to the Lord. We, we, bring our friends and family members, neighbors, co-workers to the Lord in prayer, and then literally as we share the gospel with them. And that's something that anyone can do. It, it very similar to the uh, who's your one. Right. And uh, we, we're, we're, we're focusing on building that relationship and praying and sharing the gospel with somebody just to introduce them to Jesus with the, the relational capital mm -hmm. that you have. And right. uh, so those, those resource can, resources can be picked up. That model that Andrew used with Peter, basically uh, just bringing your friend to Jesus, your brother or your friend to Jesus. Anybody can do that. And that's yeah. that's the whole heartbeat behind Who's Your One, I know. So I want to tell our audience about uh, an evangelism toolkit called Storytelling with Purpose, 
how that helps you share your story and the gospel story, kind of like you said, Johnny, wrapping your story around the gospel in several different ways. It's got a bunch of tools in there of ways to help you learn how to breach the conversation and turn it toward the gospel and share, share the gospel in simple ways, but also how to pray for those friends strategically uh, and every day. And then I know uh, that if you if you need more help with that or pastor, if you are looking for a, a free personal uh, evangelism training that uh, you can invite your people into, we have an E and E training uh, that we do every couple of weeks, and you can go to our site and register for that. I'll put the link here, and then I know that the North American Mission Board has all sorts of resources uh, like those and others on the page that Pastor Johnny mentioned earlier, uh, nanb.net/evangelism. There's <laughs> also one dot com. And who's your one? And, who's your one? That's right. and in that. Two sermons by J.D. Greer, our president, and two sermons by me that are just evangelistic sermons, uh, just saying, "Hey, here's a model of what we preached in our own churches." So it weren't it weren't set up; it just went back to Woodstock and grabbed a couple of evangelistic sermons. And then in that kit, we do just like in a resource you're offering. We talk about how to get the training to your people. For who's you want. Hey, here's a great offer for any pastor. Go to my uh, namb.net slash evangelism. I'm giving away a free book that I've read that's really ministered to me. I just gave away David Platt's and it ended November the 1st on Some Things Must Change. Yes. Now I've got Susie written by Ray, Ray Rhodes and it's about... Um, Charles Spurgeon's wife. I've never read the biography of a great preacher's wife. It's so ministered to me in light of my own wife and her ministry and contribution. So what I'll do is every quarter, it's absolutely free. A pastor goes there and says, send it to me, postpaid, uh, sent out. I think I'm up around 8,000 of David's books. And ever how many are requested, we've made a commitment to make that investment to inspire uh, our leaders in our churches. That is great. All those resources are, are free and they're there available for you. Please, please go take advantage of those and start um, or start or continue uh, fostering that culture of evangelism in your churches. You got to model it. You got to tell the stories. You got to equip your people and, uh, and plenty of ways to do that. Uh, Pastor Johnny, thank you so much for this conversation. Really, really valuable and a lot of fun to talk to you again. Lucky, same here. How can people connect with you online? Uh, they can come to jhunt at namb.net. I'm one of those strange preachers that reads all of his own emails. So yeah, jhunt at namb.net. Any way we can help them. And they can go to whosyourone.com and soon it'll see our show our 2021 schedule of all the places I'm leading conferences all across the nation. Absolutely. Sound, sounds great. Check that out. And uh, if you're, you're a pastor, of course, you know about these resources. If you're an individual, you'll benefit from these as well, um, including the, the toolkits, the uh, evangelism trainings. Uh, go and take advantage of those. You've got all sorts of ways to be equipped and enabled. So go and tell somebody about Jesus. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you again, uh, Pastor Johnny, for joining us. Thank you, Rocky. Right. God bless you all. Thanks, buddy.